and welcome to the U.S. Wheat Associates Annual Crop Quality Seminar. My name is Dr. Jane Bach, and I'm the Technical Director at the Wheat Marketing Center. And I'll be sharing with you today a special topic about understanding flower quality with the Rapid Visco Analyzer, or the RVA for short. So the question is, why do we even care about flower quality? And I'm sure most of you can think of at least a few good reasons why we care. One of those reasons is generally performance potential of the flower. We want to know if this flower has the potential to perform correctly on the line. Another question that we might have is the consistency of that flower. How consistent is it in its handling properties? Will its performance on the line be consistent every single time that you use it? And of course, there's always a price question involved. So what is the cost of this flower versus the product price versus the performance that we're actually getting out of that flower? And that equation has to balance in order for the flower quality to make sense. So flower quality can affect performance potential by influencing factors such as the structure and shape of a product, its toughness or its texture, certainly the appearance, and sometimes the taste, it will affect water binding properties and bulking. And of course, there's also the economics of that flower as well, especially in terms of how much water it's going to pick up and then give back in the oven. So how do we test for flower quality? Well, there are a large number of tests that we can use to assess flower quality. Some of the most basic are milling tests on the wheat directly. This would be experimental milling for flower extraction, for example, the ash content of the flower or the color of the flower. Other tests are physical tests, such as the farinograph, extensograph, albiograph tests, and of course the RVA would also fall into this category. You're assessing dough rheological properties or starch pasting properties, basically. Other tests include bake or end product tests, so you're baking your breads, your cakes, your cookies, your crackers, and trying to assess if the end product quality is appropriate from this flour. And of course, you have the chemical tests, which typically are testing for compositional parameters, such as moisture, ash, protein, wet gluten, falling number. So there are a range of tests that you can apply to assess flour quality for any given year. Today, however, we're going to be talking about the RVA, the Rapid Visco Analyzer. And this is a test that assesses starch pasting properties. So this is a picture of the RVA instrument. And hidden in the head portion of the instrument is a canister that holds the flower sample plus water and a paddle that's continuously stirring during the test. Now, there are other instruments on the market that will perform the test similarly. One example is the Brabender Micro Visco Amylograph. Again, you have a head that contains a paddle and a canister that holds the sample. And in this case, the canister is turning while the paddle stays stationary. Now, because the paddle geometry is different, you have a cooling finger in there, you have a temperature probe, and the canister is stirring, the results from this instrument will be different from the RVA, but they will be correlated but we're going to focus just on the RVA today. So what does the RVA actually do? Well, what it's doing is measuring the pasting and setback properties of starch and starch-containing products. So really, it's a viscosity-based measurement. The starch slurry viscosity is monitored during controlled heating, holding, and cooling temperature cycles. And viscosity is measured as torque on the rotational paddle, which is stirring continuously during the test. And the characteristics of this torque or viscosity curve are used to assess the starch properties and give an indication as to the flower quality. So let's look at those curves and see how we interpret them. So this is an example of an RVA curve and what this graphic has done is tried to show what's happening to the starch at each point in the curve. And so if you look at the x-axis, we are looking at temperature. So initially there's a heating step and then a cooling step. And if you look at the y-axis, that is the viscosity. So initially the starch granules are in their native state. And as heating proceeds, the starch begins to imbibe water 
and it starts to swell. And that's when we start to see an increase in the viscosity. As those starch granules begin to gelatinize and swell and um, paste during stirring, you'll begin to see an increase in that viscosity until it reaches a maximum peak. As the stirring continues, you'll see shear thinning of these granules as amylose leaches out and the granules are damaged. And that results in a drop in the viscosity to some minimum or trough viscosity. Now at this point, the temperature cycle is starting to cool again. And so the amylose that was leached out of the starch granules is going to start to reassociate, and you'll see that viscosity curve start to increase again. And this is retrogradation or setback. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail here. What I'm showing here is an RVA curve, and we also have pictures of the starch granules at different points on this viscosity curve. So initially, at the first minute of heating, the starch hasn't heated up enough to start imbibing water yet. And so you can see that the starch granules still have their birefringence, and they're still in their native state. Nothing is really happening with the viscosity curve at this point. However, as the temperature continues to rise, we do eventually see that viscosity start to take off. And it's at this point that we start to see the loss of birefringence as these starch granules start to gelatinize and lose their ordered structure. So this point in the curve is the beginning of pasting, and it's the first detectable increase in viscosity. This is typically governed by the ratio of amylose to amylopectin, the starch concentration that you're using, or the flour concentration, the chain length of the amylose and amylopectin that's present, and of course, their structure in the native starch granule. Now, gluten proteins do interact with starch and can affect the beginning of pasting depending on the wheat class and the protein subunits that are present, but it's not consistent in one direction or another. The presence of compounds like fiber, amylose lipid complexes, and sugars typically delay the initial viscosity increase. What we're looking at here on the curve now as we continue to build viscosities, we're looking at the viscosity peak here. So the granules have swollen to their maximum size and they're exerting the maximum torque that they can during the heating cycle. And so this is called peak viscosity and it's the greatest viscosity achieved during the heating portion. So the starch granules swell and they start to create a paste as the amylose leaches out of the native granule more viscous slurries may indicate lower amylase activity present in flour. Less viscous slurries tend to indicate less swelling capacity, which means that these starches or this flour may be more difficult to cook and gelatinize. In general, starches giving lower viscosities are more difficult to cook, and this especially applies to extrusion. Interactions with other compounds will affect the extent of gelatinization and pasting, so that peak viscosity may move higher or lower depending on interactions with other compounds. If we continue moving along the viscosity curve, after peak viscosity, shear thinning starts to occur, and you start to see a drop in the viscosity to some minimum point or some trough. It's at this point that we've disrupted the starch granules, the amylose has leached out, and you're starting to see the collapse of those granules. So this is referred to as trough viscosity or hot paste viscosity. And this is the viscosity at the end of the hot temperature holding stage. It occurs at some time point after peak viscosity, generally towards the end of the holding period or the beginning of the cooling period. And it's usually, but not always, lower than peak viscosity. This does, does serve as an indication of shear thinning potential, so the starch granule breakdown during shearing, the extent that that may or may not happen. And this is dependent on the starch composition, the temperature profile that you're using, the shear rate, the holding time, and things like amylase activity, for example. Now, if we look at the difference between the torque at peak viscosity and the torque at minimum viscosity, this is referred to as breakdown. 
And you calculate this by subtracting trough viscosity from the peak viscosity. And it's sometimes used as a means of quantifying that shear thinning potential. So starch granule breakdown depends on amylose to amylopectin ratio, starch granule surface conditions, the heating rate, the shear rate, and a host of other factors, some of which I've already mentioned. And this can be used to predict cooked texture, battered viscosity during baking, and cooking energy requirements, especially for processes like extrusion. Now, if we look at what happens to the viscosity at the end of the cooling cycle, you see that we tend to reach another maximum viscosity level. And this is associated with the cooling and reassociation, typically of the amylose chains that have leached out. And it's referred to as retrogradation, or final viscosity or cold paste viscosity. And so it's essentially the viscosity at the end of the cooling stage, at the very end of the test. And it indicates the tendency for the gelatinized starch to gel or retrograde after that cooling step. So viscosity will increase as starch chains, generally the amylose, reassociate during cooling. It's primarily driven by hydrogen bonding between adjacent chains, and it can serve as an indication of texture or eating consistency or even staling potential. So if we look at the difference between the peak viscosity and the final viscosity, this is typically referred to as setback. And it's typically the peak viscosity minus the final viscosity. It's sometimes used as a means of trying to quantify that retrogradation potential that I mentioned. So starch chains reassociate during cooling depending on a number of factors, including amylose to amylopectin ratio, degree of granule swelling and amylose leaching, and the thermodynamic drive for starch chain, again, usually amylose reassociation. So lower setback values typically indicate softer textures and or potentially slower staling rates. So how do we use all of this information and interpretation to predict in use quality? That's really the question. So first we have to understand how the test is performed. So initially, you weigh out the appropriate amount of flour into a weigh boat and the appropriate amount of solvent, typically water, into the canister. You add the flour to the solvent in the canister. You plunge the paddle down into the canister to combine the flour and the solvent. You introduce the solvent, you introduce the canister and the paddle to the head of the instrument. And then you lower the instrument head to initiate the test. So some factors to be aware of that can influence the RVA test results include the flour or starch concentration that you're using. So using different flour to water or starch to water ratios will lead to differences in the viscosity ranges that you measure. And this is something you need to be aware of if you're trying to compare results across laboratories. Another factor is time. So temperature and shear rate effects are cumulative over time, meaning they're going to build on themselves as you run the test for a longer period of time. So keep in mind that also chemical, enzymatic, and physical interactions are all time dependent as well, and all of these can influence the profile of the curve. Temperature is another factor to consider. So tests at higher elevations may be limited in terms of the maximum attainable temperatures for testing. And so at higher elevations, that lower boiling temperature, that boiling will disrupt the sample matrix and prevent accurate viscosity measurements. And that's something to be aware of. The temperature ramp is another factor that can influence the curve profile. So rapid heating and cooling can lead to less consistent heat transfer. Slower heating and cooling allows for more uniform heat transfer and therefore more consistent results. Standardized methods have been developed to balance the competing needs of short test times with accuracy of results and should be used whenever practical. Other factors include particle size. So larger particles are going to settle to the bottom of the canister during testing and that can skew readings. Shear rate is another factor. Most RVA profiles utilize a paddle speed of 160 RPMs, or a 54 inverse second effective shear rate. 
Faster or slower shear rates will alter the curve profile and may make comparisons between labs impossible. Finally, solvents, buffers, and water quality can all impact the curve profile. So water quality issues can be the cause of significant variability in test results. So deionization and or buffers can be used to achieve more consistent water quality. For tests utilizing other solvents, so for example, silver nitrate or 50% sucrose, the composition and concentration must be specified for reproducibility. So let's start to talk about how to use RVA curves to understand noodle quality. So this is an example of a standard noodle prot protocol. Total fill is typically 29 grams, and so that includes four grams of flour on a dry basis, along with 25 milliliters of water or a 12 millimolar silver nitrate solution. And this is an example of the test profile here. So some factors influencing noodle flour RVA curves include the ratio of amylose and amylopectin. So low amylose content, or in other words, high amylopectin content, is typically associated with higher peak viscosity and breakdown. The second factor is the solvent. A 12 millimolar silver nitrate solution is sometimes used to inactivate any residual alpha amylase in the flour. The presence of alpha amylase can confound results by reducing the overall peak viscosity. So in terms of soft bite noodle quality, what's really desirable in terms of an RVA curve profile? Well, typically with soft bite noodles, we're looking for a higher peak viscosity. And this is associated with higher amylopectin content, resulting in softer, more cohesive noodles. We're also typically looking for a lower hot paste viscosity, or in other words, we're expecting to see greater breakdown. So this implies greater potential for noodle deformation. What that means is basically that you expect to have a softer texture. Now, some studies have reported that a lower initial pasting temperature is desirable because it may indicate lower amylose content. However, in a commercial setting, you're likely not going to see many differences in initial pasting temperature unless you're comparing wheat of drastically different origins. In terms of firm bite noodle quality, things that are desirable in the RVA curve profile include lower peak viscosities. So these lower peak viscosities are associated with higher amylose content resulting in firmer, clean break type textures. We're also looking for more stable hot paste viscosity. So again, this implies less potential for noodle deformation or in other words, greater noodle firmness. Again, studies indicate that higher initial pasting temperatures may be more desirable because they indicate higher amylose content. But again, in a commercially relevant setting, this is likely not useful as a parameter because it's not going to be different unless you're looking at wheat from drastically different origins again. So let's look at the RVA curve profiles for different noodle flours. Looking at noodle flour A, this is a flour that's appropriate for soft bite noodles, and you can indeed see that there's a higher peak viscosity. Looking at noodle flour C, this is a flour that's appropriate for firm bite noodles, and you can see that the peak viscosity is definitively lower. Noodle flour B is the same flour as noodle flour C. However, what we haven't done here with this noodle flour is use silver nitrate to inhibit the alpha amylase. So you can see the difference between noodle flour B and noodle flour C just due to the amylase activity. So it's something to keep in mind if you're sourcing flours that have any kind of amylase present. Looking at correlation between pasting properties and textural properties, there have been many studies that have been done that have correlated um, a myelograph or RVA parameters with textural properties. So you can see that as peak viscosity increases, we see a negative correlation with the hardness of the noodle. But we see a positive relationship with the springiness and the cohesiveness. So it basically bears out that firmness of the noodle decreases as peak viscosity increases. 
The same thing goes for breakdown. As the breakdown increases, noodle firmness decreases. So there are clear correlations that you can draw if you are also collecting texture data on your noodles that you can correlate with your RVA pasting properties. So let's switch gears and talk about cakes now. So in terms of a cake protocol, typically total fill is approximately 28.5 grams or 31.1 grams, depending on what type of solvent that you're using. This typically includes 3.5 grams of flour on a dry basis and either 25 milliliters of deionized water or 25 milliliters of 50% sucrose solution. The difference in fill is because the sucrose solution is denser than the water for the same volume. This is an example of a good cake profile here, and this was provided to us courtesy of Roy Chung. And as you can see, this protocol is designed to mimic the temperature increase in the center of a cake during baking. So some factors that influence the RVA profiles for cake flours include whether or not a flour treatment has been applied. So these treatments can include things like chlorination, flour particle size reduction, heat treatment, and or starch modification. All of these treatments will generally increase peak viscosity and or lower the initial pasting temperature of the curve. Another factor, again, just like with noodle flours, is the solvent that you're using. A 50% sucrose solution affects the initial pasting temperature as well as the rate and extent of viscosity development over time. It also more closely represents actual cake batter conditions. So what's desirable in terms of an RVA profile for cake flours? Well, first of all, it may require the use of a 50% sucrose solution instead of water. Again, this is a more accurate representation of cake batter system, especially high ratio cakes where gelatinization may be delayed by the presence of significant amounts of sugar. We are looking for higher peak viscosities. These higher peak viscosities are typically associated with better starch swelling and batter viscosity during baking, which allows for greater cake expansion. Now, there are studies that suggest that a lower initial pasting temperature is desirable, but what we've found is that initial pasting temperature is less important than how quickly batter viscosity increases during the heating stage. So let's take a look at some RVA curve profiles for cake flours. Now, what we've done here in this graph is we've used an unchlorinated and a chlorinated version of the same flour, and we've run curve profiles with water as the solvent or 50% sucrose as the solvent. And as you can see, the two water curves more closely resemble the typical RVA curve profile that we've been looking at so far today. However, the differences between the two flours are very minor. When we put these two flours into a 50% sucrose solution, what you'll see is a clear separation of the chlorinated and untreated or non-chlorinated flour, with the chlorinated flour showing a more rapid rise in viscosity and a higher final viscosity than the untreated flour. And the differences are quite observable. So just based on our results in our lab, we've seen a greater difference in peak viscosity with a 50% sucrose solution. We can see a clear distinction, statistically significant, between a chlorinated and an unchlorinated cake flour, with the chlorinated cake flour giving the greater peak viscosity. When we look at other studies that have been done looking at chlorinated and unchlorinated cake flours in the presence of sucrose, we see similar results. And if you start to move your chlorination to higher or lower levels, you do see differences in those RVA pasting profiles. And you can establish an optimal range, an acceptable range, and certainly an out of bounds range as well. So looking at this with non-chlorinated cake flours, there hasn't been a whole lot of work done looking at 50% sucrose solutions for non-chlorinated cake flours. However, the little bit of work that has been done at the Wheat Marketing Center has shown that there are some clear differences between unchlorinated cake flours that are more desirable and less desirable for Japanese sponge cakes. 
And what you'll see is that the initial viscosities are slightly higher for the more optimal blends and then become slightly lower as pasting proceeds. So there are differences that you could track for more optimal sponge cakes. So in terms of other applications, there are other cap applications where RVA pasting profiles may be applicable. So one area would be looking at grain quality. There is an RVA stirring number protocol that exists to determine the degree of amylase activity in sprouted grains, similar to a falling number test. And it can be useful for screening deliberately sprouted cereals, grains, and pulses. It's also useful for assessing flour standardization. Many mills standardize their flours, especially their bread flours, with the addition of fungal amylase. The RVA can be used to confirm proper dosing with a more definitive assessment of starch pasting properties. However, you're probably going to see more use for the RVA with noodle flours and with cake flours. So let's wrap this all up. The RVA provides information on starch pasting properties such as the beginning of pasting or pasting temperature, peak viscosity, trough viscosity and breakdown, and final viscosity and setback. These starch pasting properties can be monitored for optimal product quality, including, but not limited to, proper texture in noodle products, proper expansion and volume in cake products, and the degree of sprouting and amylase dosing in grains and flours. So how would one go about incorporating an RVA into a commercial operation? Well, first of all, you must select and define the appropriate protocol for your product. And that may take some experimentation, or you may choose to use a standardized method. You'll want to screen all your incoming flour, and then keep production notes and or texture data depending on the product that you're trying to monitor. Once you've screened enough incoming flowers, you can begin to correlate production notes and texture data to RVA parameters to establish an acceptable operating range for your flowers. Typically, this will be a correlation to peak viscosity or breakdown, but you might find that other parameters are more helpful for your production. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this presentation useful and informative. Thank you.